Welcome, everybody, to the talk today on the Syria crisis, law, policy, strategy, and security. Um, I'll just provide a very quick introduction and then uh, solicit remarks from Dean Banks and George Jamison. I'll walk through a few slides for background, and then after we've each had a chance to say a few things, we'll turn it over to the best part, which are your questions, uh, which we'll have between now. And we'll have a hard stop just for those of you that are worried about your 1 o'clock classes at the 12.50 and to try to reach that. Uh, the first thing that I'd uh, like to do, I think most of you know, uh, me and Dean Banks certainly, but to welcome Mr. George Jamison, who's visiting uh, Syracuse University today. He is a repeat offender. This is his fourth or fifth visit here over the years. And uh, we're certainly very grateful to George for taking the time to come up and talk to uh, classes here and also to the uh, panel that we have today. Just by way of quick introduction, uh, George is a, a career a legal officer in the intelligence community, and specifically the Central Intelligence Agency, where he has served, um, as I was telling people earlier, you have a lot of folks that have had two years or three years or four years in legal oversight of the intelligence business. You have very few that have had decades and decades of experience, because uh, George started his duties uh, relative to legal oversight of the intelligence community in the CIA, actually in the 1970s. Just remarkable because he's only 40 years old. That's my joke. That's right. <laughs> but uh, the uh, the breadth of depth of experience that he has had uh, relative uh, not just to legal oversight, but also to policy development and also to congressional affairs, both the CIA organizations, specifically the operations and intelligence directorates there, uh, but also running congressional affairs uh, on two sides of the fence, and also the policy office at the onset of the office of the director of national intelligence is truly <clears throat> remarkable. So with that, by way of a quick biography, uh, certainly welcome you here, George, and thanks Thank again for taking the time to, like to travel up here in Syracuse. Okay, before I turn it over to uh, Dean Banks and George, I will, as I said, just walk through a few slides to act as a scene setter for the discussion that we'll have today on law, policy, security, and strategy. And uh, as you all know, I'll leave the law part to the two individuals on my left, but I will focus to some degree on policy, um, strategy, and security. I'd like to talk about just quickly five different things, and I'll march uh, through these slides. The first thing that we need to acknowledge that I would address is the, the new geography that we have, as you see reflected in the slide behind us now uh, relative to Syria, and I'll talk a little bit about the neighboring countries, specifically Iraq, but also uh, Turkey and Jordan and uh, Lebanon, and uh, to some degree the implications that it has had throughout the greater uh, Middle East and also Western Europe. But the, the new geography for Syria is comprised of essentially four different factions and four different areas of control, which you see reflected on the slide here and gets back to one of the more important issues that we're all grappling with relative to the situation, not just here, but also in Iraq, which is the new boundaries and the semi-permanent shifts that we've seen, uh, certainly in terms of demographics, because of refugee flows, but also because of areas of control in both those countries, which have lasted for some years now and are likely to last in the future, for reasons that we will uh, talk about today. Um, having said that, uh, the geography has shifted, and this includes not just Syria, but also Iraq on the uh, slide that you see here. Uh, but there have been gains and losses, and significant gains relative to the military campaign, both ground and air, and I'll focus a little bit on the air campaign in a minute, uh, that are noteworthy. And I say that because a lot of people seem to think that the situation, uh, not just in Syria, but also in Iraq, has been static, and it really hasn't. And there have been some important activities based upon uh, military operations in both countries, but especially in Syria, just in the uh, last couple of months, not the least the introduction of Russian forces into Syria, which I'll talk about here in a, uh, in a separate slide. Uh, you don't want to underestimate the scale of the, uh, the campaign that has taken place uh, so far relative to air sorties and what we know as Operation Inherent Resolve, which are the uh, combat operations that exist both in Iraq but also in Syria. But um, notwithstanding the lack of large numbers of ground operations in both those countries, there have been, we should say at the outset, uh, American boots on the ground, certainly in Iraq and also in Syria for selected operations. And that has been unclassified. But if you read the newspapers carefully from time to time, you see reflections of uh, special forces conducting operations in Syria for very selected 
primarily to protect uh, groups that are in danger of imminent attack or surrounded by ISIS forces. And we have done that pretty regularly, and I expect to see that to continue in the future. Aside from the ground activity, uh, the air campaign is fairly dramatic, and um, our own air force from the U.S. standpoint, along with the coalition allies that we'll talk about in a second, is uh, as busy as they have been in the last 10 years. We are dropping more ordnance now, air to ground, um, and the air operations run out of the combined forces air adjudication activity, which is in the Middle East, uh, that we ever have in many, many years. And it has had an impact and will continue to exercise a lot of demands and have an impact in the future. This uh, slide gives a feel for the uh, dimensions of the air operations, not just in Syria, but also in Iraq. As I said, they are noteworthy. And if you look at the numbers, they've actually gone up since the slide was made. There are more than 6,000 sorties in Iraq, and also almost a double that number. You see they're approaching high 4,000s, pretty close to 5,000 separate sorties relative to Syria. So the nature of the operations that are taking place in both those countries are noteworthy, and they have grown gradually, but uh, they are likely to continue at a high level for um, many months into the future and probably beyond that. At the same time, the uh, picture has changed somewhat significantly with the introduction of Russian forces just recently, as you see in the right-hand side of the slide that I'm showing you now. Uh, the focus of their operations with very limited numbers of ground forces, but also a fairly limited number of air forces in addition has been against not the ISIL-related uh, areas in north-central Syria and to some degree uh, central-eastern Syria, but against the opposition forces to President Bashar al-Assad, who many of the Western powers are actually aligned with. But the focus of their air and ground activity, which has been very limited, I'll come back to that in a second, has been, as you can see, in uh, western Syria against uh, forces that are Syrian but opposed to President Bashar al-Assad. I should note that, uh, as you saw earlier, the numbers of uh, sorties by uh, the Western Coalition is fairly dramatic, well into the thousands. Uh, the number of Russian sorties so far has been 80, that is 8-0. Those will grow over time because they're fairly new, but just to put in context, the, uh, the military dimensions, the purely military dimensions of the Russian involvement so far have been, uh, been fairly limited with uh, equally limited uh, impact. At the same time, there is probably no way to underestimate the scale of the humanitarian catastrophe uh, that is taking place relative to the Middle East. And we'll focus on the discussion in, uh, relative to Syria today, but we'll also focus to some degree on the regional implications throughout Western Europe, but also uh, throughout the Middle East and in some cases to, uh, to North America. Um, more than 4.1 million people have left Syria of an original population of 23 million. We only have 19 million people left in the country right now. In addition to those more than 4 million people, and these are registered people by the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees that have left Syria, there are more than 7.6 million internally displaced persons inside Syria that are in need of assistance. It has had big regional impact, as you can see reflected in the slide there, particularly in Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan, and also the humanitarian and other costs associated with them are overwhelming. Um, biggest national contributor to the humanitarian assistance fund of $4.5 billion is the United States, but the Western European and other parties have done a great deal to mitigate some of the suffering that has taken place uh, because of what is uh, gradually built up into, as I said, and as our own president has characterized, a humanitarian catastrophe. This one here is kind of an eye chart, but gives a view to the regional implications for both the internally and externally displaced persons and the millions and millions of people that have been moved throughout the area, but also out of desperation, have uh, sought to find their way across the Mediterranean and over the land routes into, um, into Western Europe. You know, whenever we talk about just figures and numbers, it's important to understand that these are real people. And... Uh, the situation with refugees in this part of the world is almost like gradually uh, warming bathwater. It's happened on a basis over the last two years. The people have kind of become accustomed to the um, scale of human suffering that's taken place because of the disruption, primarily in Iraq and Syria, but also in some bordering countries, which is at a level that we have not seen since the late 1940s. And it's not likely to go down anytime soon just based upon the challenges and the um, forcing function that exists to drive people out of their homes 
primarily in Syria and Iraq, as we'll see reflected in these photographs. At the same time, and I'd just like to wrap up by talking about the international peace, all nations are struggling to how to come to terms with the challenges that we are facing in this part of the world, including our own nation, our own country and the coalition nations that are responding to it. These are three photographs that were taken uh, between Iraq and Assyria of a uh, Canadian base that's being used for training. Uh, the former Prime Minister of uh, Australia, you see on the bottom, and the German Defense Minister in the upper right-hand corner on a visit that she made recently to the uh, Kurdish-controlled areas of northern Iraq. Uh, I show this to reflect the international dimensions, but not least. This is a real eye chart, but uh, kudos to Martin Walls for putting it together. I think Martin is probably one of the few people in the Western world that understand who is in the coalition, coalition and who is doing what, because it, we have to update this about once a week. But um, I think the important takeaway is that the international dimensions of this cannot be understated. And moreover, that all countries, uh, especially the like-minded democratic nations and certainly the resolutions that we've had from the United Nations, are struggling with how to come to terms with the challenges that we're facing in Syria and the neighboring countries, would they be humanitarian assistance, um, things we'll talk about later in terms of security-related operations, and also the pure military dimensions and the coalition that has come together to uh, look after that. Okay, final slide, before I turn it over to the, uh, the other two members of the panel, uh, we should also acknowledge from an international security uh, standpoint the global impact of what's taking place over there and a broad policy shift that has taken place by the, what I'll describe as the like-minded Western democracies, which also includes countries like Japan and Australia, it's not all Western. But um, until about two years ago, our policy, and some of you have heard us talk about this before, was to not tolerate what we describe as uh, terrorist safe havens or ungoverned, semi-governed areas or failed states. And that policy has all changed uh, just within the last couple of years. And again, it's been a gradual thing so we haven't stated it quite as explicitly as we probably should have. But because of a war weariness that exists in most Western nations, we have a situation today where we are willing to tolerate uh, fairly large swaths of ungoverned or semi-governed areas, not just in Syria and Iraq, but also in countries like Libya and Somalia and Yemen and other locations around the world. That has resulted in significant shifts, as you see in the headline here. Additional emphasis about, emphasis about things like border controls, immigration, uh, visas and waivers and just making it tougher for people to get across international borders is one way to deal with um, challenges that we're having in the Middle East and other parts of the world where there are secure areas for people to mount attacks outside their own borders in ways that didn't exist, uh, certainly uh, as far back as even five years ago. So with that, I'll wrap up the remarks. I'll leave this map up as reference for me and the two counterparts that you see up here. I just wanted to provide this with a scene setter, and with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Banks and George. Good. George, you're up. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Um, my perspective is primarily that of a lawyer working national security issues over the years. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do is quickly, I hope, make six points and uh, not answer uh, a lot of questions in making those six points. Uh, we'll leave uh, the, the Q and A for later. Uh, but this is the way I would I would want to look if I were in government uh, as a as a CIA lawyer, a national security lawyer. Here's how I would be looking at, at the, the situation that has just been described. First and foremost is. Uh, a reminder that it's important for us all not to confuse law and policy. Uh, there's a tendency on the part of the public, certainly, and, and others uh, in dealing with national security matters to point to the lawyers, say this is a legal issue, this is a legal problem, and of course there are legal issues and problems. But first and foremost, we have policy issues that need to be addressed, and let's not have the legal tail wagging the policy dog. Um, my second point is, consistent with, with that, I think, is that there's a real need for clarity in many respects. We need to have clarity in dealing with Syria, clarity on what are the policies, clarity on what are the laws that are applied to implement those policies, clarity on expectations and purpose and goal. What do, what do we hope to achieve? What are we going to gain out of all of this? And clarity 
to some extent on what are the anticipated consequences. Uh, you don't you don't just jump into something and figure whatever happens happens. Uh, you, you you have to have some clarity of what you think is likely to happen and how you're going to deal with it. That's important to a couple of constituencies. It's important to the public, certainly the American public, which has to support or would want to support or debate whatever those policies are. It's also important from a from a, a government official's perspective to government officials. You like to know what you're getting into. Uh, you don't want to have engaged in activities and all of a sudden later on come to the conclusion that it was for naught, uh, that uh, there are liability issues that can fall upon you that weren't evident at the front end. I mean, one of the things I do is, is uh, uh, formed a nonprofit to help government employees, intelligence community employees who have legal issues where they think they've done things in good faith pursuant to orders, but in fact, maybe they haven't. Uh, and so public officials like to know where they stand before the government gets into doing these things. It's also important to have clarity from a worldwide public perspective, worldwide uh, public constituency, foreign governments, potential uh, partners, uh, people who are asking for assistance. They need to understand what the U.S. is doing and why, and it's particularly important in a situation like Syria, where there's such an incredible ISIS propaganda machine that uh, the world hears things that might or might not be true, uh, and how the U.S. deals with them, how our allied nations deal with them. Uh, yeah, it needs to be very uh, importantly laid out and clear. Um, the third point, uh, very very briefly, if we're looking to sort out what do we do about Syria, the, the first question that comes up is when and why do we get involved? What are some of the considerations? Uh, is it uh, a threat to specific or generalized U.S. national security interests? That becomes an important factor when lawyers are then asked to determine uh, what is what is the legality of a particular approach. What's the justification? Is it humanitarian? Strictly humanitarian? Uh, what what are the legal regimes? What are the legal uh, what's the legal framework for dealing with the actions of one nation either against another nation or in the current world of asymmetric warfare? dealing with terrorists or others who are either quasi-states or not states at all. Um, what's our rationale? Why are we getting involved? Is there a treaty? Is there a UN resolution or, or uh, imprimatur that, uh, that triggers action? Uh, in, you know, if, if uh, a country in NATO is attacked, uh, an attack against one nation is, a, is an attack against all by the NATO uh, treaty. What do we do? Uh, next, who gets involved? Who, in the, from a strictly United States perspective, which part of the government gets involved? And, and what, what does that part or what do those parts of the government do? The options are very, uh, are, are, are very, you know, you, you look at a situation like Syria and one option is you do nothing. It's over there, we're over here depending upon the interests that are at stake, one option, one extreme, you do nothing. You can posture and wag your finger. You can engage in diplomacy. You can uh, provide foreign aid. We've heard about the refugee situation. There, there are certainly some humanitarian things that can be done. You can impose sanctions. You can seek to impose sanctions or border restrictions or no-fly zones. You can provide military assistance, uh, as you know, we have train and equip authorities uh, that have been provided for the Department of Defense to train and equip uh, rebels. Uh, gets back to for what purpose? Because we've seen reports that indicate you can train and equip to fight ISIS, but not so much against Assad, right? So uh, you have those options. You can have a full out war. You can send troops. You can bomb uh, troops on the ground, or you can do something in between, uh, something we call covert action which is, uh, at least in theory uh, and by law, something that the U.S. government can do without an official acknowledgement or about, without any expectation that those steps will be traceable back to the U.S. Well, we know how often 
nothing is traceable back to the U.S., but those things can be done. Uh, and uh, covert action options can be varied. They can be uh, at one end paramilitary, they can be propaganda, they can be uh, other measures as well. Uh, point five, uh, what's the legal framework that governs all of the above? From a domestic U.S. perspective, there's, of course, the U.S. Constitution. And uh, over the last few months, administration officials have cited to Article 2 of the Constitution, presidential authority to, to uh, undertake the activities that are ongoing. Not exactly clear what Article 2 authorities uh, are uh, intended to be uh, uh, referenced. Uh, the president has foreign affairs powers, he has commander-in-chief powers, exactly what, which of that uh, the uh, Defense Department officials were, uh, were citing to is not clear to me. Uh, the interesting question would be to explore from a legal perspective, how far does that go? How far does that enable the United States to act when uh, it is protecting U.S. interests? If rebels are U.S. interests and we're giving them uh, weapons and they get attacked by others, can we help them? How far can we go to help them? We've been told yes. If the Syrian government is attacking them, I think we've been told yes. If the Russians attack them, people were supporting, what would we do? What could we do? Another authority is statutory. This comes about in different ways, but the basic statutory authority that's been cited is the uh, authorization for the use of military force. Uh, clearer authority with respect to the goings-on in and affecting Iraq, a little bit less clear with respect to Syria, worth exploring. <coughs> the uh, other authorities that we see are in uh, annual appropriations and authorization acts. Uh, Congress certainly has the authority to fund and to demand oversight and reports. The War Powers Resolution requires uh, notification if troops are introduced. Um, a little bit less clear what's required if, if uh, uh, bombers are dropping bombs, but <laughs> traditionally the executive branch will report to Congress, quote, consistent with the War Powers Resolution, so the Congress is more, knows what's going on. Um, but then, back to the Constitution for a moment, that power of the purse and congressional authorities can often come into conflict with executive branch Article II authorities. It would be interesting to see how, if at all, that gets sorted out over the next year or so. The final point I would uh, mention, what we would look at, what we would want to look at, is international law, and here I'm going to defer but ex except to make uh, one point, um, two points about international law. We've, we've operated, uh, we the world have operated since the 1600s on the basis of a nation state principle, Treaty of Westphalia, 1648. Uh, uh, states have the right uh, to their territorial integrity. What, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, the Russians are saying what happens in Syria, that's up to the Syrians. What do we think about that? Uh, clearly not much. But the second point I would raise is that we've seen internationally uh, some steps taken by uh, France, for example, to uh, bring before world bodies, the UN, the International Criminal Court, the atrocities committed by Saddam, specifically torture, uh, torturing his own citizens. We've had a, a, one of your uh, professors, uh, David Crane, participating on the inquiry, as a matter of fact, that led to the report uh, submitting as justification for the opening of criminal investigation uh, photographs that were provided, uh, leaked, I think it's fair to say, by uh, someone who took these photographs <coughs> and tortured uh, People. So what's, what's the impact, what are the implications of uh, a country like France, first, recommending that a UN body take this on, but secondly, countries like France, Germany, uh, Spain, to, to another degree, which take it upon themselves to say, we have the authority on our own to investigate and prosecute 
tortures, war criminals, and the like. How is that going to play out over time? And all of those, um, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg, but I think some of the more important issues to focus this discussion. That's great. Uh, thank you, George. See, you know, this is a this is a difficult subject to discuss, in part because uh, it's so dynamic. Uh, just when you think things can't get any worse in the region or in Syria, in particular, they do, and it changes week by week. Certainly, the introduction of the Russian uh, forces uh, greatly complicates the strategic picture as well as sort of short-minded policy and a lot of law. I'll make a couple comments about the international law uh, framework in which the conflict in Syria is being waged, and, and then I'll step back from it. But before I do, uh, one theory or approach to intervention in a conflict like, like uh, the Syrian uh, conflict is uh, one that many of you know, at least by its acronym, R2P responsibility to protect. Uh, the, the important thing as a starting point about R2P is that it's not law. It, there's no justification for a humanitarian intervention in law at this time. But R2P is a, is a political doctrine it's a it's a policy. It's a strategic approach to humanitarian intervention that has gained credence in the last decades through various crises around the world with which you are familiar, no doubt. What better case for humanitarian intervention than Syria? I think the the uh, momentum toward some R2P initiatives was building uh, when ISIL, ISIS came onto the scene and began to steal the thunder, if you will, away from what was a, a horrific civil war inside Syria. And at the same time that ISIL uh, <clears throat> intervened and began to, to travel south into Iraq from Syria, it also provided, ironically, legal cover for the United States to act militarily inside Syria. There's an irony there, isn't there? If you consider US military interventions abroad just in recent years, and you go back only a little more than a decade, we've sort of played hopscotch with the law. We've sometimes been fully in compliance with international law and probably in violation of US law. At other times, the opposite has been true. In 2002, when Congress voted overwhelmingly to enable President Bush to undertake a new war in Iraq. He did in 2003. And on the very day that the, uh, that the invasion began, the Secretary General of the United Nations proclaimed that the United States was in direct violation of the United Nations Charter and international law. We said, thank you very much, and we went about our merry way. In 2011, when there was a sudden, fairly sudden drumbeat to remove Mr. Gaddafi from power in Libya, the international community rose up through the United Nations. Security Council passed two resolutions, which the second of which enabled military action. The United States, of course, led a coalition that did uh, act violently in, in, in Libya, probably in violation of the laws of the United States. So where are we now in Syria? As I said, I think when, when ISIL entered the, uh, uh, the, the picture here, greatly complicating things, it, it enabled the United States to act militarily. How is that so? The easy answers are two. One, Iraq invited us. Iraq was being attacked by ISIL not only Iraqis, but also, of course, religious minorities inside Iraq and the Kurds. And Iraq asked for our assistance. It's called host state consent. Once we had host state consent, we could operate inside Iraq uh, in, in any way that, that we wanted to, or in any way the Iraqis would have invited us to. And at the same time, 
ISIL was attacking Iraq from inside Syria. This is the second point. Syria was either unable or unwilling to manage the ISIL presence inside Syria. Therefore, lawfully, the United States could enter Syria in pursuit of ISIL there because they were attacking Iraq from Syria. Therefore, under international law, we are not violating Article 2 of the United Nations Charter by acting in Iraq or Syria on behalf of the Iraqis, and we're there lawfully in pursuit of self-defense of Iraq. Now, the, the, the newest complication, again, is the Russian presence. It's a, it's a, I wake up thinking about this problem. This, it's a very unnerving situation, isn't it? You've heard today there's a, there's a memo about flight space and maybe we won't run into each other's fighters in the air. That, that gives you maybe just the tiniest bit of comfort, but not very much in the big picture. Strategically and legally, of course, the United Nations can't act in this circumstance because one of the superpowers will stand in the way of the, of the next guy and, and block an action. Unless we can come to some kind of terms with the Russians about a way out of this, with or without the Assad regime, uh, the Security Council is not going to be able to take action. So. There have been suggestions. I've taken media calls over the last several days. Would Russia be lawfully permitted to attack U.S. forces in the region because we have violated Article 2 by coming to the aid, conducting an armed attack against the Assad government in Syria, which has in turn invited the Russians with their consent to come to their aid? Could Russia hit back at us? That's a scary question, isn't it? I think the answer is no, <laughs> fortunately, but it's only because our provision of equipment and training to Syrian rebels probably isn't enough to say, to allow uh, legally for a uh, decision maker to conclude that the United States that those forces are acting on behalf of the United States, that is the so-called moderate Syrian rebels. Not a close enough connection. Provision of some money, provision of some weapons, provision of a little training, they still got their own agenda, they're acting for themselves, thank you very much for the aid. If that question tilts in the wrong direction, then the lid is off the conflict and the Russians have as much legal capability to come after anything that we support in the region as we do going after ISIL inside Syria. If that Rubicon is crossed, crossed I think, uh, I don't even want to go there. So I, I think we've got a good chunk of time left and George and, and Bob has set the table uh, very well, and I've put out a few questions here. I'm happy to talk more about U.S. law. I think George touched all the right uh, starting points. There have been some measures undertaken by Congress. There's a, there's a provision in last year's uh, Fiscal Defense Authorization Act that provided $1.6 billion for the U.S. training efforts in Iraq. As you know, appropriations can constitute authorizations. Uh, and so there's some authorization for U.S. involvement in there without a specific mention of the use of military force. Certainly the, the covert operation uh, option is on the table, has been part of U.S. law for several decades now. You, most of you know about that. Uh, Congress has not otherwise acted. The other point about domestic law, George mentioned the authorization for the use of military force. I think most people agree, even the president of the United States, if you get him at a candid moment, that that doesn't work very well here. That was for Al-Qaeda and their affiliates in Afghanistan, certainly not ISIL. ISIL are bad guys, to be sure, but they're different bad guys. So for a while, you, if you paid attention to this last winter, spring, there was a fair amount of initiative, even inside the administration, toward an ISIL-specific AUMF, a new one. And most people who gave this careful thought thought that was a good idea. Identify the enemy, identify where they might be engaged, 
identify the period of time for the authorization and require some amount of transparency and congressional oversight in the implementation of such a resolution. That sort of tricked along there over the spring into the early summer, then the the wind sort of fell out of the sails, I think, as things got worse there. And now, certainly, as the Russians are in the picture, what a mess. I don't know how you'd draft uh, a law for this uh, purpose. Let's pause there and turn it over to you, have a discussion. Well, yeah, uh, Article 2, um, oh, yeah. if uh, you know, we're able to uh, uh, go into another country if the government is unable or unwilling, right? What is the limit in terms of unable or unwilling? Like, for example, let's take Pakistan. Pakistan was not engaging the Taliban, not really. But we were, so we were able to go in and use drone strikes and things like that. The Syrian government is actually engaging us. So they've been fighting for, well, ISIS and other jihadist groups for years now. So what, at what point is it they're unable or unwilling? Do they have to be able to completely vanquish them? Or do they just have to be fighting them? Like, where is the line? Yeah. So, so Will's talking about Article 2 of the UN Charter. Yes. And he's talking about a doctrine that has evolved over time, but mostly recently as customary international law that helps qualify when it may be permissible to use force in another nation uh, and not run afoul of the limitations, the sovereignty boundaries that protect nation states under Article Mm 2. So it's customary law. By definition, that means it evolves through state practice. There's relatively little clarity about the scope of the unable or willing. In fact, it's it, it's more a notional standard right now than it is one that's part of opinio juris. It's not reflected in the judicial opinions of nation states at this point. So the, the short answer to your question is, I don't know. But it's a, it, we're making law, I think, on a daily basis as we try to articulate the scope of permissible authority here. The Syrians clearly don't have the upper hand in dealing with ISIS. If there's any place that has the, if there's any group that has the upper hand in their dealings with ISIS, was the Kurds uh, uh, have success in in managing their their piece of territory in the border area uh, between Iraq and Syria? I would just add to that a, a purely military uh, comment, but um, it's probably a broader debate that we need to have. And I, I can't address the legal issues, but we are um, today engaged in. Title 10, Defense Department, combat operations in Libya, in Somalia, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, and to a limited extent in Mindanao in the southern Philippines with JTF 510. So it's, I, I can't speak to the legal issues, but certainly in terms of the executive branch of the U.S. government and this administration, they, they do not show any reluctance. And again, you have to read the newspapers carefully, carefully. Just recently, there was a fairly significant airstrike by manned aircraft in Libya by the United States Air Force. Uh, not classified, not help, but, but not something that people talk about a lot. So I think the use of force and a uh, pretty long list of countries right now is something that has been, I guess, regularized. And just from a Defense Department standpoint, is something that we uh, have set a pretty high threshold for. Right. Nate? Uh, this gets to what I was going to ask Professor Moret was just talking about and something that Mr. Jamison mentioned in his. Uh, there's sort of a distinction that seems to occur uh, on the legal side as far as when we really want uh, direct authorization of use of military force. This is some speculation I'm hoping you might clear up for me. But um, in Libya, it was largely an air power assisting mission. Uh, in Syria, it's largely air power assistance right now. Um, but when we went into Iraq, when we went into Afghanistan, with uh, troops on the ground is where a real differentiation occurred. And we made sure we had an AUMF in place. Um, but in Libya, you know, they're manned aircraft. In Syria, they're manned aircraft. And if those planes get shot down, we have boots now on the ground in that country, and we don't really have, you know, uh, an authorization set up for what's going to become a boots on the ground response to get those people back. Um, and I'm sure we have contingencies for recovery of down air crew personnel, but we're pushing into that realm of extended presence, you know, a, a physical presence on the ground that we don't seem to have, that we seem to historically 
require more legal authorization for without that authorization in place beforehand. Um, and just one thing with that is, would it be different if we we're using unmanned aerial vehicles as opposed to manned vehicles? Let me, let me give you an answer that maybe is a little cynical, but the whole question, in my view, the whole question of, of getting specific congressional statutory authority is really just coverage. Uh, and it it is based upon a recognition, going back to Supreme Court case law, that the, the actions of the executive are at their strongest, strongest basis when Congress and the executive agree. And so when you have a situation where Congress is on board with what an executive wants to do, it's, it's good politics and good policy to, to accompany whatever the executive action is with a statute that says, yeah, we really mean it. And, and then you're on board and, and it's more difficult to criticize the actions. The difficulties come up where there's disagreement on policy and the executive does one thing. If Congress is silent, uh, that's too bad for Congress. Uh, they can spend money or not, and and I have to say one of the big questions in all of this is where's the money come from? Uh, if, if the U.S. is engaged all over the world, one of the big policy issues is how do we get the money to spend on it? Um, and if Congress legislates in the opposite direction and says the executive wants to do X, Congress says not X, now you've got a real constitutional battle and, and that's the sort of thing lawyers think about. But I, I think that, um, you know, whether you get an AUMF or not, and I suspect that this is a part of why the executive branch official under Secretary of Defense uh, indicated there are Article II authorities, is basically saying we don't, we don't need no stinking statute. We, we can do it. We have the legal authority. The statute would be nice for coverage. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Amanda. Um, my question has to do with the Russian prosecution. Um, you were speaking about whether or not we're actually technically um, able to be in Syria um, and whether or not the Russian forces would be able to um, attack U.S. forces if that were the case. Um, and my question is, to what extent are covert operations and um, armed and uh, rebel groups in Syria that we have armed considered um, U.S. forces, especially when we have an interest. Um, I know right now the majority of the Russian attacks have been on um, rebel groups that the U.S. has armed. Um, so to some extent, that's a, you know almost like a proxy war. Um, so I was just wondering legally um, what the implications are for that. That's a great question. George, it's right up your alley. <laughs> Time's running out here. Right? <laughs> um, first, let me, let me make it very clear. I have no actual knowledge of what the U.S. government or the CIA is doing in or around Syria overtly, whether they're doing anything or not. Um, so I, I know what I know from what I read in the newspaper and conferences. Um, the, the, the broad question of the extent to which a group that is receiving U.S. assistance is uh, seen as, uh, as if it were the United States. Uh, that, that's a tough question. Um, let me, and, and I can't say I know the answer. Uh, I think a lot depends on something um, referred to earlier, which is the degree of support is a factor, the degree of control. Um, if uh, the United States government is, and, and covert actions over the years have been run in different ways where some of them have in fact been limited to, here's, here's a pile of money, go off and do stuff. Uh, at the other end is, here's some funding, here's more than funding, here's some training, and here are the instructions, here are the guidelines, you must operate under these principles. There's, there's a sliding scale, yes. May I clarify? Yeah. I, covert operations, I specifically named 
special forces that would train um, certain batches of the police leader and army or something? Um, okay, well, you know, the assistance, okay, co just so you know, covert to me means non attributable to the U.S. Sounds like what you're talking about is maybe it's clandestine or secret, but basically public U.S. policy, public funding to go to, to specific or general Syrian groups in, under the, the train and equip <coughs> program. Congress has appropriated, I think it was, what was it $500 million last year. Billion and a half, actually. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think for, for Iraq, for the Syrian opposition groups, it was, was, it was 500. Oh, yeah. sure. You're right. Okay. Um, Two different forms. And so, um, I, I, you know, I, maybe I defer to, to my colleagues here, but um, the only restrictions, the, the sort of, there are vetting requirements, uh, commitments given that, uh, or, or expected that the recipients of the aid will not be undertaking actions to overthrow or, or go after Assad. Uh, so, so they're not going after the Syrian state. Uh, the U.S. actions are to support anti-ISIS ISIL activities. Um, I, I, I think the the only answer I can give is, and I think this is the right answer. It's a fuzzy line. It's a fuzzy area, and and to a great extent, it's it's a situation. <laughs> Um, and and the, uh, the real answer doesn't come out till you know who won. Uh, the, the winners kind of get to write history. Again, a cynical comment. Uh, uh, it, the extent to which, in a particular situation, the actions, the actors, are doing things at the direction of the U.S. government, it's more likely that they're going to be that, that the actions are going to be attributable to the United States. Uh, others would argue if you're if you're even only just funding them, knowing full well what they're going to go off and do, even if you don't control them, you have a responsibility. But I I, I cannot I don't think that there's ever been a fine line, a clear line drawn on uh, at at what point. Uh, it can be seen as attributable to the United States. There's no question the rebels, there are rebels who are getting U.S. Fund, funding, training, and assistance, uh, and, and there's no doubt that the U.S. supports that. But I think that the military and the U.S. generally tend to take the view and the approach. Uh, we're assisting them, but they're their own people, and we, we're not telling them exactly what to do, I think. I think it's a very good answer. It, you, just, you want to be careful about your terminology, too, though. So special forces are U.S. military, correct? So that's a, that, that would present a very different question. We're not fighting there. We're providing training and equip to Syrian rebels. And it, as in my response to the earlier question from Will uh, or my opening statement about the, the fear of getting entangled with the Russians there, if it's them following their own agenda and they're using some money and some equipment that we provide, we're not implicated in violating the UN Charter because they're acting, the rebels, on their own behalf. So the same analysis would support an answer to your question to Mr. Jameson. It's, a, it's an agency question for the law students in the room. Agency law says it's about direction and control. And we're not we're not directing and controlling. We're providing some money and some training and maybe some equipment. So we stand short of that. Let, let me add something. Let's go back in time to Iran Contra days, uh, mid '80s, uh, where for several years there was this give and take within the U.S. government, this back and forth over funding. Do you fund the the, the uh, Contras? Or do you not? And under what circumstances can you not fund them? And, and the law was changed. Some of you may have heard of the Boland Amendment. There were a series of amendments, of amendments that put restrictions on what the U.S. government would do. You may fund them generally. 
uh, but boy, it sure looks like they're trying to overthrow the government. You may not fund them if they have the intent to overthrow the Nicaraguan government. Well, we're not funding them with the intent that they overthrow the government. They can do whatever they want. And, you know, you know it, it, the way some of that debate ended, I remember, was that there was a provision that talked about you may not provide assistance to the Contras um, where they're going to use it to even fight uh, or go after the, uh, the government forces. And, and our then general counsel s said, uh, well, I'm going to, uh, that's fine, but if we're giving them defensive intelligence, information to protect themselves from attack, I'm going to say that that's not in violation of the law. The Hill didn't like that, but they accepted it. And, and the reason, it gets back to one of the things I said earlier, uh, not only do we have to be careful to distinguish law versus policy, but we also have to recognize it's not always easy to do that and that law and policy often merge. And I think when you're talking about training of forces, um, uh, if the military, if and when the military is training forces, uh, it's a fine line. And, and back to my main point, clarity is important because of the government officials involved. You don't want special forces training people and suddenly finding themselves in front of an international criminal court or, or some UN sanctioned body because they've somehow crossed a fuzzy line. Professor Sales, uh, great panel, really enjoying it. Um, I was hoping that the panel could talk a bit about, so this is a policy question, not a law question. Um, I was hoping you could talk a bit about the broader geopolitical implications of Russian involvement here. So, so Putin is there to prop up a client, but he's also probably playing a longer game. Um, what's the longer game? Is it access to a Mediterranean port? Is it destabilizing uh, the NATO alliance with Turkey? Uh, what do you think his broader ambitions are here? I think it's all of those things uh, that you mentioned, Nathan. I, I think beyond that, though, it's one of the places where Putin and the, the Russian government is seeking to reestablish their uh, flexibility in a place other than Ukraine or Georgia, um, especially after the operations in the Crimea and uh, in eastern Ukraine. And also one of the few windows they have to actually flex their uh, international uh, military capability in ways that um, might not be universally accepted, but that will not be resisted completely. You know, Bashar al-Assad is in Moscow today, for those of you who have been reading the newspapers, um, and he's trying to establish additional linkages uh, at a time where it's been very difficult. You know, uh, there are very few Western countries that he has been able to visit, but if you analyze the remarks that he made at the United Nations last month carefully, it was actually in its own way um, a fairly distinct set of principles. And, you know, he made two major themes in his speech to the U.N. that I think is going to be reflected in Russian policy for well into the future. And his first argument, Putin, uh, Putin, yes, uh, Putin, mm -hmm. and not, not our own president, but, uh, but Putin at the United mm -hmm. Nations. Um, first point that uh, you need to be very careful about regime change and, and that there are some distasteful regimes that all of you in the West, he wasn't just talking mm -hmm. to the U.S., but Western coalition uh, members uh, probably need to tolerate a little bit more than you might otherwise, even though they have done despicable acts, which is certainly both in terms of chemical weapons and bombing of their own civilians, and also uh, killing uh, Syrians that have been in custody, which number of the thousands. Uh, we, should, we should note that 200,000 Syrians have lost their lives already uh, since the battle started three years ago. It's a very, very high count of uh, people killed. In many other uh, circumstances that Bashar al-Assad is personally responsible. Notwithstanding that, I think the Russians have a higher tolerance for dealing with bad actors who happen to be in charge. Uh, and that is something we have to be careful about. Uh, without getting cynical, I would point out that even Henry Kissinger said last weekend that maybe we need to deal with very carefully chosen words, the Assad regime, not Assad specifically, but some kind of a transition so that there is not a complete collapse of government the vast because in Russia is a country that we have to deal with for that. So. Uh, the first point. The second key um, thrust that I think Putin is, is seeking is reflected in his uh, comments uh, at the United Nations last month is his sensitivity for what he still describes as the near abroad for Russia and uh, the intent that he has to uh, continue to uh, act pretty aggressively in former Soviet states, which is something we can plan to see. That's great. 
I mean, it, it's also the message that the Russian military is back yeah? for us all to see. Europeans, Americans, others around the world, they may not be the superpower, but they have a potent military that's uh, been modernized considerably in the last decade. So, time for a couple more, sir. I have a question for you. You wrote a question about Iran. I let me ask you about a question about the Shmanda forces. Would you mind telling us what I mean what are you going to say about the Shmanda forces? The Shmanda forces are fighting against ISIL, ISIS in Iran. Today we need the United States help. How can you help us to fight against ISIS in Iran and in Pakistan? I think my comments, it's a good question. My comments earlier were uh, meant to include the Peshmergas uh, so that the, the law is supportive of the U.S. being able to come to the support of that group inside Iraq because of an invitation. It's, it's all a matter of political will and, and policy now. And I think that uh, that legal basis is going to exist for some time, whatever else we decide to do there. The, the Russian entrance has made the picture much more complicated, uh, but it's more complicated politically and strategically than it is as a matter of policy or as a matter of law. Man. Yeah, just one final, I, you know, the, the map, uh, to come back to that, you know, Greater Kurdistan, which is largely being established uh, as a matter of fact over the last several years, I think the long-term geostrategic challenges that we have in this area after you ask yourself whether or not you want to go forward with the borders that were first uh, set up 100 years ago by the Sykes-Picot Agreement, um, is what the long-term uh, boundaries will look like for what is involved as Kurdistan, but also Shia and Sunni areas between Iraq and Syria. Yeah. And, and that is the broad strategic issue that we have. Last question. I want to ask a question about, uh, you mentioned that it's not in Syria before, but there's a lot of uh, I always wondered why it's a civil war, why it's not a revolution, because it's people uh, leaving the administration, and for six months uh, they were peaceful, and then they went to be uh, armed um, against the dictatorship regime. So why is it a civil war? I think those, that label is equally apt. The, the question then is what can outsiders, those from uh, places other than Syria, do in support of it? And as I indicated earlier, international law stands in the way because of the charter's protection of the sovereign boundaries of any nation state, unless you develop a, a, an approach like R2P, responsibility to protect, which I, I think is emerging, but does not yet have status as law. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you all.